This is part three, Greco-Roman xenophobia. The slide appears to be a little off kilter here. I created a PDF out of it, so it is what it is. So this, uh, this still image, by the way, there's a video on YouTube. I think it's from like cracked.com or something. And this guy's talking about how the Persians were, he was talking about the movie 300. And in the movie 300, the Persians are depicted at pretty much um, opposite of what they really were. And the Spartans were also pictured pretty much opposite of what they really were. It's an interesting video. Um, I forget what it's called, but if you just look up the truth about, probably the truth about uh, 300 or something like that. Very interesting. So, according to the Zoroastrian Magi, there is little distinction between magic and religion. This is where, in this part, we're going to explore the flip that happened from the teachings, from the philosophy, the laws, the religious ideas of old Persia and the Zoroastrians and how it was imported into Greco-Roman society in, in Western civilization. And we're going to look at the flip that happens. We're going to look at uh, exactly this kind of upside-down world that... Um, sort of magically just happened, and then all of a sudden, the Persians are the bad guys. <laughs> so according to the Zoroastrian Magi, there really is uh, effectively no difference between magic and religion. So you can imagine, since there's a big difference between magic and religion in the West and in Christianity, you can imagine what kind of trouble you could get into, right? Not so in the... Central Asian religions. This sentiment is as true today for the 200,000 adherents of this faith as it was at the time of Zarathustra. This idea of magic, reality being magic, our existence having this profoundly incredible mystery to it, right? That's that this mystic tradition comes from old Persia and India. So if for the seeker, you is, if, if you're watching my channel and you consider yourself a seeker, if you're looking for more information, you're looking for more knowledge, if you're like me and you, your highest virtue is truth, knowledge, and wisdom, that sort of thing. If that's, that's probably why you're drawn to this channel, by the way, is that um, if your highest virtue, if you're a knowledge seeker like I am, um, it helps to be an Aquarius or uh, one of those types, right? Um, some sort of intellectual erudite type of person, I guess. Um, although I'm, believe me, I'm not, I make a lot of mistakes, so I'm not, uh, the smartest person ever, that's for sure. But if you're a seeker and you observe your inner world and then come to the outer world and observe that closely enough, there really is no doubt that our manifested reality is nothing less than the highest form of magic. At least to me. I mean, I'm looking around this place and, I mean, we've been... For thousands, thousands upon thousands of years in the West, since the time of Plato and, and well before, right? Um, we've been, um, we haven't proved really that, uh, for example, we haven't proved that the, the mind and the brain are, you know, like, like the mind is the, is the, um, is a an effect of biochemical processes, right? Consciousness is, you know, I think that's called the hard problem of philosophy, right? That um, your 
your mind, your 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 soul, or your consciousness. You know, consciousness is is viewed as in the modern day in science, it's viewed as kind of an effect of just biochemical processes, right? That hasn't been proven, right? It just hasn't been solved. So there are these there are these questions that we have about our reality that um, lead to you being the seeker, lead to mysticism, right? Um, ultimately, the seeker or the mystic f realizes that there are no answers. Um, there are some answers that can be framed from a human perspective, but it ultimately, there are no ultimate answers at this level of humanity, right? If you rise and if you, if you are coming into your higher self, your higher awareness, if you, you can, you can know more, right? But from a human, strictly human perspective, it's very limited what we can learn about ultimate reality, right? We've tried, we've smashed a bunch of things apart at the CERN particle collider, uh, for example, and we've, you know, we found the Higgs boson and we've got the guard, God particle and, you know, but Particle physics has hit a has has hit a brick wall, right? Um, the old the mystics of the Tibetan Buddhist traditions are saying, you know, we're very happy to see physical science in the West is confirming what we've what we've gathered in ourselves, what we've learned intuitively. They've learned explicitly. Um, we're we're glad to see them learning it that way. Um, we're glad to see that they're confirming what we've known for thousands of years, that kind of thing. But there's limits. We we reach a certain limit, and then we really can't know anymore with, from the human perspective. There has to be some kind of change happening in order to, to know more. But the mystic and the seeker, we all kind of, we embrace that, right? You want to embrace that mystery. It's And know that you're something more, because that mystery is you being if you are a mystery there's so much more to you that is unknown that than that is known and that is that's incredible that's an incredible feeling if you really go into that so mystics seekers and adepts of occult science um this um our reality if you really pay attention it's plainly evident that this is a magical process this is an amazing mystery to us. This is a mystic, uh, mystical, magical process happening. Even though we live in this information age, this we're coming into this Aquarian age, we have this um, part of us that we know deep down that wow, there's we really don't know our our ignorance is without bound. It's it's nearly it's in the, it's infinite. It's it goes on forever, and what we know is just very tiny, right? So this understanding, this intimate understanding of our world has largely been ignored, right? People want to have certainty, especially in the modern modern day, right? It's nice to be certain about things. I'm not saying you go through your life and just be completely uncertain, right? But be open to the possibilities, right? That's what a seeker is. A seeker is open to possibilities, not narrowing themselves down and closing themselves off and building all these expectations and I'm certain about this, you know, and if you're <laughs> if you go through life like that, you're going to be disappointed again and again and again. Right. So you try to be open. But this um I feel like there's a shifting happening where um this recognition, this deep recognition of the mysterious nature of our reality is making a comeback because after the enlightenment we're as human beings we're starting to realize this is deeply unsatisfying to you know just to make just to declare well god is dead and we're not going to we're going to do our own thing we don't need god anymore right there's something happening we're going to approach it in a different way that we're not going to go back to the old way there's no sense in that so as we grow as individuals and as a society by rising above what came before, right, which is transcendence, and by including what got us there in the first place, that's kind of the trick. And 
And so what happens is a lot of old traditions are thrown away, but some of those traditions that got us to this point should be kept because those are the ones that, that got us here. Some of the other ones we can throw away, right? Having the wisdom to know the difference is important. So advancement of self, advancement of yourself growing in yourself or advancement in a civilization does not occur by transcending what came before, right? By growing out of what came before and then completely rejecting it, right? There's good and bad about the past and some of the traditions that got us here. We need to take the good and leave the bad. If you want to see, here's some great examples in cinema. If you want to see what happens to a society which transcends what came before and yet tries to completely reject its former self, I can recommend a few movies, such as The Giver, Logan's Run, THX 1138, and I uh, just put in Minority Report too. That's... Uh, Figured I'd, I'd have another uh, another modern reference there. Th THX 1138 was directed by George Lucas. It was his first film. Fantastic movie. There is a scene in there where there's this little kiosk, this little confessional kiosk, and it's really weird. Um, but uh, yeah, if you want to see what happens to to a society that that tries to abandon its traditions tries to abandon human, uh, ancient human wisdom. Um, these are, these are some great examples. So while this presentation is not an attempt, of course, to convert the audience to the Mazdan way, it is well known that the Zoroastrian religion lived in harmony with itself and in harmony with other faiths. It's not a religion based on conquest. Right? There's, there's no... Conquest comes in when you have this insecurity that um, there are other religions or there are other mystic traditions unlike yours that may threaten yours. Right? This... Uh, I'll talk about just the Zoroastrian tradition specifically. Um, it's a practice which inclusively honors the magical and sacred nature in everything in the world, especially nature itself, right? The natural world. And it treats all things in the world accordingly, right? So if there's no difference between magic and religion, if there's, if you're part of this, if you realize you're part of this magical process, then essentially what you may conclude is that you yourself are divine and you are in a spirit world, right? And if you, if you come to this conclusion, then you treat the world differently. You see the world differently. You see yourself differently. You're no longer on probation <laughs> where there's a God in heaven over there and he's always watching you. And then um, here you are, in this other realm, this physical realm, and you are um, separate, and you're trying to get in. Let me in. You know, when I die, I want to go to heaven. Let me in. You know, that, um, that's, a, that's not a good worldview to have. <laughs> because then you go, well, I want to get out of here. What the hell am I doing here? Just go to heaven then, right? If... if <laughs> If that's what you believe in, that's the ultimate goal, then just go, right? You should just go now. Why wait? <laughs> so ha so you can see this flip starting to occur between Eastern religion and Western religion, right? So after all, only religions that are steeped in disharmony and insecurity would be so compelled as to expend great effort and suffering in order to compel non-believers to join in their folly, right? Uh, I think Alan Watts called it the desperate company of odd fellows, right? The desperate company of odd fellows want, they need you to join. 
If you're a non-joiner, that threatens them. It makes them feel like there's something wrong with them. You have to join, right? That is, uh, that's an insecurity deeply embedded in the Christian faith. Not all Christians, don't get me wrong, I'm not here bashing Christians. I've met some wonderful Christians who aren't, who are beautiful, wonderful people, and, and I respect them and love them. So I'm not Christian bashing. I'm saying that there are some, some problems in the overall doctrine, especially if, you, if you're a Christian and you paint by the numbers, right? You just go through the motions and you do what you're told to do. You're not, you're on a very low level spirituality, right? You haven't, you haven't come into your own divinity and realized your own divine essence, right? So a religion of peace embraces and respects all, but does not desperately seek to convert anyone to its own particular habits of worship. Why would you want to do that, right? If you are comfortable in your own spirituality and you're on your own path, why would anyone have, why would it be a problem, right? <laughs> and of course, this is the mantra of the Zoroastrian faith, good thoughts, good words, good deeds, right? So evidence of this transcendence and includence can be found throughout the evolution of Western civilization. So now we're going to get back to the Western influences of uh, Persia influencing the, uh, the Greeks. And we're going to look at how some of those traditions were adopted by the Greeks, adopted by the Romans by the West, and then kind of, some of it was just kind of denied. At least the origins were denied, right? So although in the Greek tradition, and subsequently in most of Western civilization, this includence and acknowledgement of Persian influences has largely been forgotten. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, we have to, every minute we have to be mindful we have to celebrate our persian roots and everything you know we're far removed from that that's that's not what i'm talking about what i'm talking about is there's this there's that flip that happened between this not seeing a difference between magic and reality and then seeing a difference between heaven and earth right and uh oh if you're doing magic if you're doing your own operational theology if you're doing your own spirituality then you're then you're a witch and you have to be burned that's what i'm essentially talking about right this famous painting entitled the school of athens by raphael depicts the greatest philosophers mystics and natural scientists attributed with the birth of western civilization included amongst the who's who of greek civilization is a persian magi astrologer otherwise known as Zoroaster of Babylon. It is known that Pythagoras was a student of the Persian Magi as well as the Egyptians. So I thought this was pretty cool. Found this Zoroastrian guy kind of hanging out in here. There's some also some um, philosophers from parts of the Middle East and Africa in the upper right. Um, maybe someone can tell me who all these people are. I've I've looked this up and some of uh, I've seen like I know who the major people are, but I haven't seen every single character in here um, labeled. And you can see you can also see the artist is standing. I believe that's Raphael himself standing just to the right of Zoroaster of Babylon, looking at the audience. So it's amazing. Uh, it's quite an amazing uh, painting, and it's very famous. I'm sure anyone who's um, been to college has seen uh, has seen this, or hopefully. <laughs> so the Greek philosopher Herodotus, he's considered the father of history of the Greeks. 
and possibly I would I guess I guess that makes him the the father of history of Western civilization. He wrote this about the Persian religion. The customs which I know the Persians to observe are the following. They have no images of the gods, no temples, nor altars, and consider the use of them a sign of folly. This comes, I think, from their not believing the gods to have the same nature with men as the Greeks imagine. Their want, however, is to ascend the summits of the loftiest mountains there to sacrifice to Zeus, which is the name they give to the whole circuit of the firmament. Right? This circuit of the firmament is, is the unseen, the occulted world, the Shiva, as it were, that holds. The, the, the nothingness that which upon the everythingness rests upon. Right? They likewise offer to the sun and moon to the earth, to fire, to water, and to the winds. This is this part at the end, offering to the earth, fire, water, and the winds, is the sacred nature of our reality. The four elements, of course, are sacred in the old Persian religions, such as Zoroastrianism, and they have they even have. Um, Religious holidays, the Parsi people have religious holidays where they have a fire ceremony. So xenophobia. So now we're going to get into like, we're, we're, we're getting into these early examples of accusations of witchcraft, right, and sorcery. So xenophobia and ethnocentrism throughout the history of the Greco-Roman civilization is well known by historians. There were many court cases then during this era which were launched against foreigners and political adversaries on the grounds of sorcery. Preying upon the ethnic bias of any host culture against a foreign culture is an age-old effective strategy for domination and control not to mention confiscating their wealth, right? There's that idea that quite a few of the witches in the Salem witch trials and those in that era, those some of those women were widows. They were wealthy widows, and there were some schemes to remove them from their money. So this, this is quite an old idea, right? Not a big surprise. After Christianity became the prominent religion, in Rome, it was the same age-old biases which served to buttress the distinction between religion and magic, right? So there's this flip happening where the, the church is clearly on the lookout for anyone not doing it the way they approve, right? Anyone who's doing it their own way, coming into their own personal, um, bringing their own... Um, coming into their own divinity, they are sorcerers, and they need to be punished, right? So magic of any kind was subsequent, subsequently forbidden, according to the Catholic Church. Such practices came to Europe from Persia and Egypt, and so it was automatically associated with the strange and unfamiliar practices of foreign ethnicities, right? Um, I would even say the term pagan, Right. The term pagan was associated with foreign people at that time. And so if you were labeled pagan, you were probably a sorcerer and you were accused of causing harm to people. Right. And so that was another way to take non believers out of the out of the culture, out of the civilization, and remove them of any wealth that they might have. So righteous crit critics of the church and its practices were quickly silenced by accusations of sorcery. So if you were, say, a philosopher from the East, and you were, you were able to uh, point out some things that were, you were able to drop some truth bombs 
on the church and they didn't like it, then all they had to do was label you a sorcerer, right? It's kind of like today, if you're given certain labels, that's it. You're done, right? There are certain public figures that have been given certain labels. Um, of course, not sorcerer. Um, no, Really, not a lot of people believe in that anymore. Um, but at least they don't believe that magicians and sorcerers are going to affect them, although they do. Um, there's some very powerful sorcerers in the world. This, uh, this idea that the, the foreigner coming into your land, and especially the Persian or someone from an older civilization coming to your land and going, why do you guys, why do you guys do it this way? Right. That's that's a lot to make. Uh, that's going to make that's going to ruffle some feathers and also evoke some insecurities from this younger civilization, this less mature civilization. Right. There's a reason why in India they have. You can't even count how many different. How many different temples, how many different religions and there's no state religion it's a nation of seekers essentially there's no state religion there's all of these different i mean it's just it's mind-boggling it's mind-boggling how many different faiths there are how many different ways there are to worship right and that's of course ref reflects this uh here in the west that would be that would be looked at as uh, sorcery right but over there it's normal because you are a divine being and y you know you have a rough framework and then after that, you find your own way. So today, right, righteous voices of dissent are sometimes accused of terrorism, right? The very same ethnocentric and nationalist bias is used today for, uh, to great effect. There are other examples, which, I, which isn't really, doesn't really relate to word magic, so I'm not going to get into those, but you get the point. Right. There's modern day people that are branded as modern day, you know, fill in the blank, modern day sorcerers of some sort. And that's all for you. Hi, this is the end of this part of the video. Stay tuned for the continuation next week. If you enjoy what I'm doing, please subscribe, hit the like button and uh, feel free to add your comments as well. Thanks so much for watching. See you next week.